economy developed that demanded numerous skilled and semi-skilled workers, a condition that eventually created a growing middle class and common schools. Why we need the schools in the other colonies or the New England colonies? We needed to educate people to do their jobs. It, it was bustling economy, uh, free trade, free markets, and we needed people to work in them, so we needed to train them. So the early laws um, for uh, this time came the O'Deluder Satan Act. Okay, and that you're going to get that here uh, from the North of the early laws, the Old Dilute and Seder Act, Satan, Satan Act, and this is number 17. You talk about what that is and why they passed that law. The Old Deluder Satan Act. Let me come back here. You see here, uh, the Middle Colonies were very diverse in their inhabitants. Uh, individual groups to establish their own religious schools and they believed in this apprenticeship, mo apprenticeship model. So now, let's go on. Oh, I missed, I want to give you this too here about the northern colonies. Live close to one another, tell them sprang up. Numerous skilled and unskilled laborers. So I don't know where this came from. That is not in the reading. Religious groups, rapid rise, the middle class. This is interesting, this religious perspective in the classroom. If you read this, this is the old classic uh, student versus teacher, uh, teacher, uh, an evolutionist, uh, a student, a creationist, and what happens? I mean, you get a chance to read that. That's almost as classic as abstinence only debate in our schools. But that would have to be in here. Colonial schools almost always were religious in nature. Okay, so again, uh, so interesting, almost always. Uh, Religious uh, compared to today is just interesting. The Bible is often the only book they used, and religious prayer, uh, prayers were routinely used in colonial classrooms. And it really was up until what was it, fifty something, where even the public schools there was prayer every day in the classrooms. But the concept of separation of church and state did not exist at that time, and that's not true. That did, that's not true. The concept was there, but the law was already there. The above perspective on diversity features relates as possible dilemma for contemporary teachers. And I'm one of them that cannot uh, reconcile the, these positions. Again, I'm uh, uh, professing to be a man of faith in a country that's a, a country of faith to stamp down uh, religious freedoms in our schools is just beyond what I can stomach. And yet uh, I would be very, in my position, my thoughts are very outside the norm in our country and mostly because a small group of people with the perspective of these authors have taken control and beat that down that way but just about every classroom had religion in it and it was part of it here and um, all classrooms you don't have to write that but I'm just saying it for you so types of colonial schools, well first there was this dame school, sprang up in a colony such as dame school, which was conducted by a housewife in her home. She, uh, the writing school, which taught a child to write, a variety of church schools, and charity, uh, uh, or pauper schools, taught missionary groups. So, I want you to tell me what each of these different schools were for here. This will be number 18. You have... Uh, dame school, a writing school, church school, and charity schools. Those four things, what they were for, and that was just stated right here on page 37. Again, the reason I have you bring that in, I want you to hang on to that, and I have that for later, is what those different types of colonial schools were. Okay, a Latin, in 1635, a Latin grammar school is established in Boston. Why in Boston? Again, remember, because there were so many like-minded people there. The Puritans all settled there. They agreed on things. They, they could rally around to get the money to do this. 
first permanent school of this type was the United States. The grammar school was a secondary school. Its function was college prep. We're sending their preppies to college, and so we're going to prepare them for that. You got to remember, schools at that time was really about a, a, a K, uh, or, I mean, a, a first grade, just an elementary type look of school. And so this was huge, uh, a college prep school, and it was called the uh, Latin Grammar School. Julia spread it quickly. Other towns, Charleston opened its grammar school later, um, number what, 16 years after Massachusetts Bay Colony, founded eight town Latin grammar schools. And they were transplanted from Europe where schools had existed for a long time. These schools were aimed at preparing boys for college and, again, this would never fly today, be of service to God in church and in the commonwealth. Cool prep. And so this is number 19. And you're going to put here a service to God uh, and commonwealth. Prep for college, serve God and commonwealth. The early American college, Harvard, was Harvard, first colonial college established in 1636, preparing ministers. Yes, Harvard, the anti-Christian faith school now, at that time was prepare ministers. And that's so interesting if you look at all these. Women, Mary, Yale, Princeton, King's, College of Philadelphia, Brown, Dartmouth, Queens College, all were very religious schools, all based on uh, Christian principles, and all have turned completely secular and completely rejected that heritage. And not only rejected it in these colleges, but are trying to stomp it out and revise history to uh, say that it wasn't part of their college. You go into those places now and try and find any remnants of that history of their founding that had to do with Christian faith. And I'm telling you, it's been scrubbed clean from their universities. That's how far they're trying to distance themselves from the Christian faith. And again, these colleges all were Christian-based and heavy emphasis on theology and the classics. An example of the extent to which religious motivated dominant clinic can be found in 1642 rules governing Harvard College, which stated, this is from Harvard, 1642, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ. Now, I challenge you to go to Harvard and find any place that has anything like that now, even though that was the origin of their college in 1642 when it started. I'm telling you, I have a, I just can't reconcile that. It's just so weird. And these uh, monetarial schools, let me tell you what they were fight. Economical mass elementary education to large numbers of children, okay? So they agree in New York, we need schools. Let's try this. Let's do like, typically a teacher would teach hundreds of pupils using better students as helpers. Okay, think about this. Hundreds of elementary students because by then they realize we need a trained group. So can you t tell me why that would fail? These schools failed. This will be number uh, 20. Why did those monetarial schools in New York fail? And that's right on page 38. And this guy has, uh, Horace Mann has a long standing education, is one of the more influential ones, but his big thing was he established common elementary schools after the failure of those monetarial schools. Common schools were designed to provide basic elementary education for all children. And another impressive achievement of his, he started these journals, the Common School Journal. And this kept educational issues in the public eye. And also at this time, and he was not as connected with this, but we came up with compulsory and attendance laws, compulsory education laws. By 1900, 32 states had compulsory attendance. So prior to that, you didn't have to go to school. Now, again, let me tell you from my history compared to yours, is I lived in a time where... Uh, many, many more people lived on, uh, on farms. And we were more, way more of an agrarian society. And many people could make very good living 
without a lot of education on these farms. Now, of course, today we would make a huge stink that that can't be anymore, but it was then. So this was huge, and the rural communities fought against a little bit, but 1900, now today every state has some compulsory attendance laws. Every state does, including South Dakota. So what is the compulsory attendance laws in South Dakota? And so what I'm going to have you do is like we did before, I'm going to have you Google just, and I think you can get away with this, just Google compensatory attendance laws in South Dakota and uh, you should come up with the state's website and it'll tell you exactly what the compensatory attendance laws are in South Dakota. So then you're going to uh, come back and tell me what that is. And again, like here in your notes, you're going to have compulsory attendance laws and you're going to uh, come down here and I didn't get that right, did I? And you Google that in the same way. You don't have to link it this time, but you're going to, again, this is under home. You go to this review here, and you tell it to uh, put a comment in there. Review, new comment, and tell me what the, right here what the sorry. And what you should find on that is it was just changed in South Dakota in 2009. So you tell me what it was and what it was changed to, the compensatory uh, attendance uh, laws for school in South Dakota. And that would be number 21. Then this Bonnard, Barnard guy, oh, I know too, I want to tell you about fun, uh, pu financing public education. This is here highlighted. Was always been a challenge in America. And again, I assert to you its perspective of the authors there's no evidence of that, but that is a continual contention of people with this perspective. It's really 1795, Connecticut legislators decided to sell government-owned land, public land, and create a permanent school fund to help finance public schools. As more and more children attended schools, other states soon took action to establish school funding plans as well. And there's no doubt that there's a continual strife and battle uh, over this and the federal government is stepping in the feds are going to start levying taxes I think to fund our schools even though the this is specifically granted to the states but uh, you know in recent years you'd have to be asleep not to know there's uh, there's a strike over this but to say that it's always been a challenge uh, I would contend is an assertion from this perspective that they bring to uh, this textbook and everything else they do there's no evidence of that that there was always been uh, financing and it was always an emerging state that how do you say that back then when everything was so new and they not even agree everybody agreed the need for education in early times so it fits their narrative that they want to from uh, propose in this so Bernard he was the first commissioner of education and his thing was also as the school journals uh, education he founded So that was his thing. First year education commissioner. Then uh, reflections of early U.S. elementary education. We took um, okay. So here's the reflections. First, they were primarily religious. And two, discipline was traditionally harsh in elementary schools. Traditionally formal and impersonal. Uh, I have it highlighted, taught poorly prepared teachers, and the three R's are the main thing. And so I have that here, and what I want you to do here, this is number 22, is uh, here's one, two, three of those assertions. I want you to add the other two. Okay, and this is getting kind of long. You put these two in here, plus two, and then you take a break. And then you come back a little bit later and finish this so this doesn't get too long. All right, hopefully you took a break and after we studied about the elementaries. And now, what is the need for secondary schools? 
contemporary U.S. high schools have a long and proud tradition. And you think of, uh, in our communities, how important the schools were and what meaning it gave to our communities. Uh, we've lost a little of that in our bigger schools, but in our smaller communities, there was a huge uh, part of uh, community life. So they've evolved from a series of earlier forms. Secondary schools were created to serve the needs of society in various points in the nation's history. So first of all, American academies, there was a need for more and better trained skills. That's what drove this. That's what drove high schools, and then eventually a more school behind that is a better trained uh, workforce. So Benjamin Franklin was the first one in Pennsylvania. He, um, the Franklin Academy, the American Academy, is all geared young people uh, for employment. And uh, that was a big step that you would have schools that their primary focus was for employment. And the English classical is the first high schools. And they taught like math and science and history. Uh, they were the first ones that were uh, established around the New England also. Again, this still because they could agree so many people the same. The Puritans were there. The junior high consisted of grades 7, 8, and 9. That came along in the early 1900s. Middle schools uh, later than that, six, seven, eight, and you cannot, your none of you can remember when a junior high was grade seven, eight, and nine. But when I was in school, like in the Sioux Falls schools, uh, that was middle school. The ninth graders were in the junior high, and uh, only in the high school was ten, eleven, and twelve. And most of you didn't uh, didn't see it, didn't go to schools like that. And then when the middle school concept came on, uh, I think it caught on here in the early 90s in Sioux Falls. And they had a big transition of moving all the ninth graders to high school, moving all of the sixth graders out of the elementary into uh, middle school. And I remember when this happened. It was a huge, huge uh, struggle here and the biggest problem the biggest problem with the change wasn't the students or the families it was the teachers and here's why because suddenly you had a whole group of teachers that thought they were middle school teachers that were forced to move to the high school and had a whole group of people that had been elementary teachers forever suddenly were middle school teachers so there was lots of pushback in Sioux Falls when this change happened then the evolution of teaching materials the horn book so maybe that was what they learned to uh, to read on. A sheet of paper showing the alphabet was covered with thin transparent sheet of cow's horn and tacked a, a paddle a shaped piece of wood on it. That was looped around the hole in the middle of, so that students could hang on to the horn books around their necks. And there's an image over here on, that shows that. But they walked around with this thing uh, hooked on them. Now, as paper became more available, the horn book evolved into a several-page book called a battle norn. Okay, because back then there wasn't. When we talk in this era, uh, in the mid 1700s, there wasn't much paper or pencil, and so there was all kinds of other things. And the New England Primer was the next thing. Very few textbooks were available to them. Um, uh, mostly, the Bible is what was used again because. They were considered con um, concerned mostly with entering heaven, and so uh, throughout this, they wanted to educate people so that they could uh, be closer to God, and so you needed the Bible. They had a few books with history and geography and arithmetic. So the first real textbooks used in this were the New England Primer. First copies of this book were printed in England in 1600. Also printed as early as 1690 in the American colonies. This is an image of the horn book. Paper underneath this th thing. Here's the handle uh, so that they could have, hang on to it. The blueback speller, that was very important because uh, spelling was so important in early reading. We don't hardly pay any attention to it anymore, it seems like, with our technology. But uh, even when I was in school, it was a huge deal.
By 1800, nearly 200 years after colonies established schools, the yellings and teaching materials were still very crude and meager, and you can begin to see that here. Here's the New England Primer. Different books. And slates, about 1820, a new instructional device, the slate, was introduced in American schools. These slates were thin, flat pieces of uh, stone framed with wood. The pencils used were so also made of slate and produced a, a light blue uh, legible line that was easily erased. This is the blueback speller. And by 1900, uh, pencils and paper had largely replaced the slate and slate uh, pencils as the writing things. So I just grabbed a picture of the slate here. I Google slate writing boards. And you've seen some of these, I'm sure, at some point. But that's what they looked like. They're primitive ones. And then was the McGuffey Readers. Same way they know Webster, the blueback spellers replaced New England. The McGuffey Reader was eventually replaced the blueback. It became very popular, sold 60 million copies. These readers were carefully geared to each grade. Meant to instill children respect of hard work, thrift, help, self-help, honesty, and I, and you can still find these uh, in some of the museums. But it was a huge, uh, huge turnover, huge change in education. Private, often so coeducational. Technology and all it says about technology interesting is that oh, like down here I highlighted uh, for instance searching for, on any of the teaching materials just mentioned such as uh, example horn books provide you with not only written information but also pictures of horn books and one thing too that's changed here but the big way uh, technology has changed and it kind of alludes to it here is there it has allowed uh, students to have unlimited amount of information at their fingertips. When I started school uh, in 1967, the purveyors of information in schools, as most places, were two, two sources, textbooks and teachers. And now, in the, you know, in the 21st century, that have flipped over where those are getting to be some of the least reliable sources of information. Information now is at your fingertips in the machine, whether it's your smartphone, your iPad, your Chromebook, whatever it is. And you, the job of the teacher has dramatically changed. And I don't think we're doing a good enough job of this, of preparing you in this way. And that is how to manage that much information. Not only teaching you how to manage it, but your job will be now not to provide, be the purveyor of information to students, but helping them manage it. For one of the things that we have to learn to do uh, very quickly is how to av assign value to information. How to understand, like when I flipped up slates here, all the different things here, all the other different slates. So if you're working with students, is this the primitive slate? You know, or is it more like these here? So you, your job will be to help them assign value because everybody's out here is putting information up at their fingertips. You and I are providing information that goes up in the World Wide Web that people have access to. And are we authority enough in this that people, other students, that come along and look at our stuff and, and take it as factual, as accurate? That's how technology is going to uh, change uh, schools. But this is about understanding history, and that uh, there's lots of information out there. So early education for diverse populations, and this is fits the narrative that this uh, these authors want to really promote. Uh, sad but true that students of color, girls, students with disabilities have historically badly underserved by our educational system, and until relatively recently have often not been allowed to attend schools. And that's true. Uh, education of African Americans, unfortunately, general efforts have been made only in recent in this country to provide the education of African Americans. Uh, in the following subsections, we briefly explore why this was the case and discuss some early African American educators. So early church efforts, again, uh, why uh, 
the church got involved because they see saw the need even uh, for the slaves uh, to be closer to God to enter uh, gates of heaven. So that's why the uh, missionaries and the churches were so motivated to reach even the slaves. And here the earlier ones were French and Spanish missionaries, so people came from other countries to work with the slaves to try and educate them. Uh, and this thing of uh, colonists had a way to overcome the idea of converting slaves. People of Christianity might logically lead there to their freedom. So if these uh, slaves convert to Christianity, will they become free? Was a, a kind of a conflict. The church governing bodies and the Bishop of London settled the matter by decreeing that conversion to Christianity did not lead to formal emancipation. And so there they were allowed to, to go on and, and work with the slave. Now this is interesting. The organized church nevertheless provided the setting where a few African Americans were allowed to develop skills in reading, leadership, and educating their brethren. Often, uh, African Americans and whites attended church together. And what's so interesting about that, of all the integration, this is rarely mentioned, but this was the first true integration of African Americans was in the American church, was in the Christian church. Nothing else was allowed to be integrated, but it was the first uh, place, the first institution where they sat together and worshiped and learned and praised together was in American Christian churches. But really downplayed, you don't hear that in our history. Eventually some preachers were, who were former slaves demonstrated exceptional skill in spreading the gospel. The Baptists in particular by encouraging a form of uh, self-government allowed African Americans to become active in the church. This move fostered a growth of African American congregations. And it was a huge deal. It was where really a lot of the, the movement of the African Americans got their start was in the Christian church. In the early schools, one of the first northern schools established for African Americans was this Elias Noe in New York City. Noe was an agent of the Society of Propagation of the Gospel of Foreign Parts. And again, obviously church related, or so much of this came from. Back over here. So the African Americans organized attempts to educate African Americans. Frederick Douglass emphasized vocational. We're just coming to Frederick and vocational education. Uh, prove the play of the African Americans. And I don't think, let me just uh, do that. Let's. Um, Uh, so uh, Douglas's thing uh, was vocational education. It could have greatly improved their life. He thought the previous attempts by educators to combine liberal and vocational education failed, so he emphasized vocational education solely. So here this is going to be... We haven't had one for a while. Number 23. Number 23 here. You describe or define what is vocational education. What is vocational education? Because we don't hear a lot about that. It started to reemerge uh, vocational education. It was huge uh, when I was in school, and then it went away, and now it's it's coming back in gangbusters. So uh, Frederick Douglass uh, knew the importance of that, and so he emphasized that. Then John Chavis. Uh, Individual has success acquiring education as well as their groups. His thing was uh, became a, a successful teacher of aristocratic whites, and his white neighbors sent him to Princeton to see if a Negro could take a college education. Interesting, could take a college education. His rapid advancement under Dr. Witherspoon soon indicated that the venture was a success. He returned to Virginia later, went to North Carolina, where he preached among his people. That's right, he was a preacher. Spread the gospel. The success of John Chavis, even under experimental conditions, represented a small uh, step toward education of African Americans. Okay. So, so Chavis, aristocratic.
you get to look this up. Number 24, what is an acristic, uh, aristocratic, aristocratic, uh, he said aristocratic, what does aristocratic mean? That'll be a good one for you. Prudence, Prudence Crandall, young Quaker, established an early boarding school. Prudence Crandall uh, had these schools. Uh, let's see, where are they mentioned? Crandall finally. Oh, she um, she let a colored girl into her school. She was white, and uh, they they weren't supposed to be allowed at school. And she was recruiting other ones. So finally, they petitioned state legislature to enact a law to would make it legal to educate African Americans. And Miss Crandall was jailed and tried before a Supreme Court in July. And the court never gave a final decision because they found all kinds of defects in the way the case was presented. She continued to wor uh, work in abolition of slavery for women's rights. And, uh, so she was jailed for educating uh, black children. Booker Washington, he's one of my favorites, uh, was one of the early uh, African-American educators who uh, contributed immensely to the development of education. A he realized that African-American children were desperately in need of an education to compete in society, and he founded the Tuskegee Institute. And that's what you get to put here for him. Uh, this is number 25, the Tuskegee Institute. And then early American uh, colleges, it was a kind of a long, slow burn for them. This is a note I pinned here. I can't remember what I pinned here. There. Yeah, a long, slow process here of this. Long, slow process. This admitting um, to to the American colleges. Asians are interesting, very interesting. The Asians. One thing is very little written here, and again, I think the authors take a leap here. I filed, you just allow me to read this to you about educating Asian Americans. The Second World War brought about discrimination against Jap uh, Japanese Americans. The U.S. government placed more than 100,000 Japanese American citizens in internment camps, and in some cases confiscated their property. Do you know that? Have you studied that in history? That's exactly what happened, is the President of the United States at the time decided that the Japanese were bad, so any Japanese that were in our country were rounded up and put in prison, and their stuff confiscated. Uh, I hope we don't have that again. I feel like we're headed towards that in our country, but uh, it's a part of our history that's dark that nobody will admit. Um, in the decades following the Korean Vietnam War, a number of Asian immigrants to the United States had increasingly dramatically. Large numbers of Vietnamese, Cambodians, Laotians, and Thais have been included in this uh, recent immigration. Although many of these Asian immigrants have experienced considerable success, the majority have struggled to receive an education and find suitable jobs. Many feel they have been discriminated against and have received, not received equal education, employment, and opportunities. And I'm going to contend, contend here that's not true. That if you study the demographics of percentage, the percentage of people in this country that are Asian descent, whatever that number is, and then compare it to the number of people, the percentage of people that are imprisoned, number of people that graduate high school, graduate college, that they're way underrepresented in those, the things that you would say mark whether they're a failure or not. They have less Asian Americans on unemployment, less on welfare, less on government tolls, less dropping out. Uh, Percentage-wise, uh, they're, they're very successful in this country, and this is why this doesn't fit the narrative of this chapter that these authors want to tell. They haven't been discriminated against. They've done well from themselves. They didn't let any discrimination get in their way. And so it's very interesting they would contend that they've been discriminated against here because they're very successful, percentage-wise. And I forget what it is about 12% uh, of Americans are uh, Asian descent, something like that. 
and yet you know way less than 12 percent drop out way less than 12 percent uh you know are in prison way less than 12 percent of them are in uh on the government rolls uh on the government dole so it's very interesting and i say in this whole thing they give one uh paragraph about it so that's all i'm going to write here for asian americans they were successful And Hispanic uh, number of uh, Americans used uh, schools have increased dramatically in recent years. Uh, very interesting uh, the, the migration, immigration of the Hispanics uh, from south to north. Uh, in the history of our country, the immigration has always been the east to west or west to east. But these, for the first time, we have immigration from the south. Uh, it's really heavily. And down here, I mark, unfortunately, Hispanic American education did not develop as quickly as the majority of the population. This discrepancy is due, at least in part, to the fact that many Hispanic Americans are in lower income brackets that have immigrated to the United States without well developed English skills and may have suffered discrimination. Like other minority groups in the United States, Hispanic Americans have not historically been afforded equal educational opportunities. Now, can I go again? This will set, may set your head or hair on fire, but I'm going to contend part of that is that uh, a big portion of them came here illegally or not documented. And what does that mean? Well, then they didn't go through uh, any of the normal steps to become American. So they didn't learn English and they didn't have standards like that. So they didn't learn the English skills. Everybody else that immigrated here went through this same process uh, at Ellis Island to be uh, immigrated into this country. So very interesting that they don't mention that in this discussion. And again, because, in my opinion, it doesn't fit the narrative that they're trying to tell uh, here. And what they're, the story that these authors are trying to tell is what a disgraceful uh, educational system we've had, a, a very um, uh, discriminating system we've had. And that, that's the narrative here, and it, that doesn't fit to mention that uh, some are illegals. But the ones that came here legally and went through our systems have done well, are educated, and have done well. And then there's a whole section on educating women. And um, starts here with Emma Willard. She opened uh, one of the first female seminaries in Troy here. And so I'm going to give you that. Uh, so this, uh, this is number here. I'll get the population increase significantly. Struggle of population rapidly increase. Educational opportunities. Okay, struggle to receive equal education. So. This is um, 22. This is number 26. Number 26 is here. And what she started, and make sure you mention this, that she's from uh, seminaries in uh, Troy, New York, 1821. That's what you put there. And Montessori, I know about Montessori because my kids went to a Montessori when they were young. And emphasize the independent, independent work by children under the guidance of a trained teacher. And that's what my kids went to. Mariah Montessori had this idea that kids could kind of navigate themselves. Um, and so you'd create a big room that has all these engaging activities. And the kids pick their own. And then the trained teacher works with them on how to do it. And my kids loved it. And I thought it benefited from that. And so that's what you put here. This is number 27. And Ella, let's look at Ella. Outstanding female educator. Ella uh, overcoming immense obstacles here in a doctorate at the age of 50. Under Dewey, it was appointed head of the Cook County Normal School. Bruce superintendent of the gigantic Chicago public school systems. So all achievements were unheard of for a female at the time. She also elected the first female president of the male-dominated National Education Association. So let's, let's give her that. First female of NEA. And that's number 28. And Mary McLeod Bethune, what did she do? She has, she was one of 17 children born to an African American parents in Mayville, uh, North South Carolina. One of 17 children. That poor mother. Okay. And here was her thing. She eventually started the da uh, Daytona National Industrial School for Young Negro Women and the Bethune Cookman College, where she served as president. So that's what you bring in for Mary here, number 29. And then number 30 
you tell what is the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. Last part, private education. Private education has been extremely important in the development of the United States. In fact, private schools carried on nearly all the educational and colony to colonial times. Okay, private meaning Christian education or church religious schools. The first colonial colleges such as Harvard, William and Mary, Yale and Princeton were all private institutions. Many of the early were, right here, religious affiliated schools. So interesting, and why this is so interesting to me is here we are a couple hundred years later and we have went the opposite that we have done everything they can to stomp this out to kick this out to kick any people of faith or any mention of faith out especially the christian faith so interesting so we had this the right to private schools to exist in 1816 the state of new hampshire attempted to take over dartmouth college which was a private institution a lawsuit long uh, out of this ultimately resulted in the u.s supreme court's first decision involving legal rights decided that private schools charter must be viewed as a contract, cannot be broken. Um, subsequent court decisions have confirmed the rights of private education in a wide ways. Uh, generally speaking, for instance, courts have confirmed that private schools have a right to exist, and in some cases have shared public funds as long as funds were not used for religious purposes, such as uh, states, uh, uh, textbooks, and tra transportation. When I was in school, uh, I, even though I went to a private school, uh, we used the buses. We rode on the buses with the kids and went to public school, came to school and went home from school. We had textbooks from the public school for our secular classes. But this doesn't happen anymore, and there's been some challenge to this in recent time that a lot of places have, aren't allowed to do this anymore. But I'm just going to say this, and again, if this sets your hair on fire, you can go tell the dean and uh, the dean can do with me what you will, but what she will, but this, uh, I think you're going to see uh, the government come after these private schools again, and the ones that's going to come after more that isn't mentioned in this book is um, uh, uh, homeschool people. The feds want control of the school. That's the Common Core method, or Common Core uh, curriculum that's came out. They're going to enforce this. They're going to force uh, public school or private schools to do that. They're going to force homeschool people to do do this. Um, can I flip back here? I just thought of something that I forgot to mention that I think is important. We talked about the Hispanic, uh, the Asian Hispanic here, but there's a group that is not mentioned here that's just so interesting to me. Think about this. Think about this for me. What group is not mentioned here that is by far the most discriminated against group in our country? Anyone? Anyone? the Native Americans. If there's one group that we have a long history of discriminating against and oppressing more than any other, is the Native Americans, and that's not part of this discussion. I wonder why that is. For private schools, I say, I think there's gonna be some, uh, some uh, trauma ahead for the private schools. I think the federal government's going to want to control them. So the important role of private, uh, of private education in America, um, many schools, uh, the Roman Catholics and Lutherans have the most. Uh, for instance, Congregational Quaker, Episcopal Baptist Methods all have come up with their own schools. Uh, this, however, uh, who eventually was uh, elaborate was a parochial system operated by their respective domination, denominations. So parochial schools. Um, Roman Catholic parochial school system, system grew rapidly after its beginnings in the 1800s, and Roman Catholic schools mushroomed between 1900 and 1960 from about 85,000 to more than 5 million students. The Roman Catholic parochial school system in the United States is now the largest private school system in the world. Let's take a look at this. Right, this will be your, uh, where are we at, 31. You get to define exactly what is a parochial school. Define this. Can I uh, make another statement here about the private schools and the religious affiliated schools? And again, you're, you want to disagree with this, that's fine. But I think one of the things in the uh, evolution of our country, especially in our schools, 
if we went from a, a religious based uh, education, predominantly Christian based, to where we are today, and we've taken great steps. Again, this is my thing. This is what happened to this in our country. The ACLU started using the courts to change policy. In 48, the Supreme Court used separation of church and state to outlaw school prayer. 62, the Supreme Court again declared prayer in schools was unconstitutional. Uh, 63, the Warren Court stopped schools from Bible reading in classes. In 1980, the Supreme Court declared that posting the Ten Commandments and violated the Constitution of the United States. So that's, you see kind of the evolution I was in about this time. This was a huge step. Prior to that, was very not unusual. And again, uh, you maybe agree that these, uh, and there's lots of problems with it, but uh, here's my contention, and this is what you can disagree with, that we, as we push God out of our schools, the guns and violence and drugs moved into our schools to the point where we're at today. But it started here was this key turning point. Uh, many people say 62 and 63 were the key turning points in our schools. And again, why I'm bringing this up is because of the evolution of uh, religious affiliated schools, how that's really the origin of all of our education in this country, not only in our formal schoolings, but in our colleges. So many of these very, very, very uh, well-known popular colleges origins were private, were Christian-based colleges. And so that's find that so interesting. So again, uh, the last chap, the last paragraph here is interesting. They go back to this thing of perspectives. Perspectives on education is change, challenging and changing world. Major theme: differing perspective change to also apply to educational history. Historians approach the history from different perspectives, and I say they uh, there's no hidden amount here of their perspective of it. And I'm sorry, I push back on it so much. Here's a pretty good summary of the chapter you may want to visit. But there you have it, chapter two, history in a challenging and changing world.